afternoon or wherever you happen to be watching this. Uh, this is Jim at the House at Pooh Corner at Orca Media. And this is interview number three with Philip Kraske. And he is the author of 11 9 and the Terrorist Who Loved Bonsai Trees. I say that slowly because you probably, it's a, it's a tongue twister. Uh, 11 9 and the Terrorist Who Loved Bonsai Trees. And uh, my book review of this wonderful book is at um, vermontindependent.com. Net. So if you go to vermontindependent.net and type in my name, something like that, or 11.9 on the terrorists who love bonsai trees, or Philip Grasky, you will be able to read the review that I wrote of this, of this fun and exciting and very important book. Uh, Philip uh, asked me as a kind of preview to this particular interview to give you a little bit of an update on the activities, either in the United States or elsewhere, where the 9-11 Truth Movement, called Truthers uh, for some reason, um, the 9-11 Truth Movement is still making an effort to bring certain aspects of 9-11 to court. And they have to be very careful one reason is that the FBI has decided that 9-11 truthers could be considered terrorists. Now, where they draw the line, of course, is entirely up to them. But if you bring something to bear as a 9-11 truther that has already been established, I don't see how the FBI is going to find a way in. And on the other hand, if you bring something to bear that's completely ridiculous, They'll love that because then it makes truthers look all the more silly. I mean, for example, what if a 9-11 truther came up with the idea that some guy in a cave defeated the entire military apparatus of the United States and caused buildings to collapse symmetrically when they had had uh, asymmetrical damage and uh, shut down the, uh, the FAA effectively and caused the, a the F the FAA to destroy evidence and caused FEMA to destroy evidence. I mean, a theory like that, uh, I, w I suppose the FBI would love that because it's absolutely idiotic. So it's interesting to me that the FBI took the steps to announce that uh, truthers could be subjected to a prosecution through terrorism, through domestic terrorism. And as you probably know, if you're watching this, uh, that means whatever they want it to mean at the time. And it means it's secret. So we will uh, talk a little bit about that with Philip Kraske. Uh, but here's the latest development from the 9-11 Truth Contingent. And this is tiny print. I couldn't make it any bigger. So, and it, uh, it's hard to read, but let me, it's important. So I'll try to give you some of this. Uh, two fire districts in New York are demanding a reopening of the 9-11 investigation. To sum it up, they know that explosives were used and they are demanding a real investigation that has every incident and every crime called to account. This is new news. They just released the following statement. The Franklin Square and Munson Fire, De uh, Fire District 9-11 uh, resolution says, whereas the attacks of 9-11-2001 were inextricably and forever tied to the Franklin Square and Munson Fire Department of New York. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a, there's a gap in this, so it's, it's difficult to piece it together. Um, uh, and Thomas J. Herzl, badge 290 of Hook and Ladder Company, the Munson Fire Department, uh, was killed in performance of his duties along with 2,976 other emergency responders and civilians. And whereas 
members of the Munson Fire Department were called upon to assist in the subsequent rescue and recovery operations and cleanup of World Trade Center site, affli aff afflicting many of them with illnesses as a result of breathing the deadly toxins present at the site. And whereas the Board of Fire Commissioners of the Franklin Square and Munson Fire Department recognize the compelling nature of the petition before the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York reporting unprosecuted federal crimes at the World Trade Center from 9-11-2001 and calling upon the United States Attorney to present that petition to a special grand jury pursuant to the United States Constitution, etc. Uh, in said petition, uh, said petition demonstrates beyond any doubt that pre-planted explosives and, um, and other incendiaries were used and not just airplanes. Now I did, I forget whether it was two or three programs with those people bringing forward the grand jury petition. So we will give you further updates as to the success or denial of the petitions and the work of these two fire departments to bring things forward. Uh, I said when I first heard about the grand jury effort and I interviewed the wonderful people who were bringing that forward, I told them that in the past any evidence whatsoever that would obviously lead back to certain parties would be excluded no matter how difficult it was, no matter how legally impossible it seemed, that evidence would be excluded if it came right to the heart of the Bush administration, the deep state, and Israel. And I particularly mention Israel because they were the only party actually caught. Everything else is, you know, we, we know that Osama bin Laden couldn't do it, we know this happened, we know that happened, but the only people actually caught and well described in the, in the uh, newspaper coverage at the time, the only people caught were Israelis. And Chertoff made sure that that got taken care of and they got sent back to Israel. So here we are today in a situation where the evidence is coming, it's, it's not new, but it's finding its way into the court system, into the legal system. And so as a journalist, I'm interested in seeing how that evidence is either ignored or buried or swept aside, just as other evidence has been swept aside in the past. And um, I primarily today want to talk about this wonderful book, but then Philip Kraske and I will tell you a little bit about the importance of, the historical importance of certain events over the years in this country, 9-11 uh, being the one we're going to focus on. Uh, to me, it shows a little bit about me and that I'm not married to the idea of uh, the United States government is always good. It always has good intentions, that is to say, and it sometimes makes mistakes. I think that's an idiotic idea, and we can talk about that today. Uh, I have seen in my questioning of officials in the past that they simply, no matter what, no matter what kind of evidence is possible, they will not look at it privately, publicly, ever. They simply will not look at the evidence. And that's a combination of willing ignorance and it also involves the cover-up of evidence that will lead in the wrong places. So these people just pretend, whether it's you know Bernie Sanders or anybody, they just pretend that the whole concept of 9-11 truth is carried out by questionable people who have nothing better to do, and not by patriots who would give their lives for the truth to come out and for the uh, guilty people to be prosecuted. So with that rather long introduction, um, I will ask uh, Philip 
Kraski to tell us a little bit more about himself, because you may have missed the first two interviews we did, and also tell us, uh, give us his own introduction to 11-9 and the terrorist who loved bonsai trees. Okay, take it away, Philip. Well, thank you, Jim. It's uh, good to be on with you again. Um, well, anyways, uh, just uh, briefly, the, the story, um, which I don't want to go into too much because we've talked about it previously, but I'll just give you a brief rundown. Um, Eleven Nine and the Terrorist Who Loved Bronzeye Trees is a, a thriller, and uh, it starts when Trudy, who is a conservative, quiet statistician, arrives at her new company, a digital marketing firm, uh, to start her first day of work. The company is in a converted brownstone in Jersey City, which is right across the river from Manhattan. She goes in and she sees these paramilitary guys all over the place and a bunch of dead people laid out in the living room. One of the military's tri paramilitaries tries to grab her, but she manages to get away. Twenty minutes later, a car with six terrorists who just botched their job of planting a bomb in the Empire State Building pulls up to the same house with the police on their tail. They run inside. A hostage standoff begins. The hostages now ostensibly being the employees of the company. Well, this ends uh, badly, and the majority of the terrorists are discovered to be Iranian. Well, the U.S. now wants to go to war with Iran. So what we have is actually a false flag op that ends in war with Iran, which might sound familiar. Uh, so on one side, the story is about Trudy, uh, now presented to the public as one of the terrorists, running from the people chasing her because she knows that the whole event was staged. And the, on the other side is Paul Clippin, an American State Department official who's trying to keep a deep state cabal from starting war with Iran. Um, and I'll give your listeners a, a hint, Jim. Trudy and Paul have met before, okay? Well, anyways, that's what the book is about. And uh, I uh, uh, published it now in April. And uh, I'm uh, even selling a few books. I've uh, been quite happy. Uh, uh, sort of a steady trickle of sales, that's good. And even some of my, some of my old books, my, my previous four titles have... Uh, awakened a little interest so that's uh that's good news so mm -hmm. and uh, anyways as to me i i live in uh a little town a little village that goes back uh, two thousand years uh north of madrid about 40 miles and uh about 50 yards down the street from where i live uh there are uh little canals that used to uh, run from the town well all over the town so that they delivered the, the water through these little canals. And there's uh, some of these old ones uh, from 2,000 years ago, uh, just down the street from where I live. So, well, anyways, that, how, how's, that, how's that for an intro? <laughs> well, thank you. It's romantic, is what it is. It is, um, it is romantic. Uh, the, the, the church tower in my town goes back also about a thousand years. It was actually put up by uh, the uh, Arabs and uh, they used it as the entrance to their mosque and they could, from the top, it's about, oh, I would say about seven stories high and it commands a view from the bell tower way up high. Uh, it commands a view all around of uh, the valley where I live. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite an interesting town. Hmm. Well, it's compelling. Now I, now I really want to go there. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's the nice thing about Spain. You know, it's one of the reasons I really like cycling. Every five, seven miles, you've got a little town that, you know, goes back a uh, thousand years or so. And mm -hmm. uh, beautiful uh, uh, little uh, churches and monasteries and uh, castles. Uh, there's, a, there's a real regular castle with uh, towers and moats and everything uh, right uh, about uh, 10 miles away from me. They use it as a convention center now, actually. Hmm. Well, I'm, I'm glad it's still there. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah absolutely. Uh, I, lived near, I lived in Besançon, France for a while, and uh -huh. uh, we were near some charming places like that, 
like Pontalier and other small towns in France where the stone homes were built up along the river. And so you, you couldn't have a more picturesque and, and romantic lifestyle than to live in a stone home built, you know, a thousand or hundreds of years ago on a crystal clear river that flows through your little town. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's the nice thing about Spain and France. The whole, the whole country is just uh, one huge museum, uh, mm -hmm. and you can just go forever just looking at things. Yeah. Yeah, but hopefully it it can remain that way. But that's another topic altogether. Um, so, uh, as far as the book is concerned, one of the things that you will learn, uh, reader, gentle reader, is that the players on both sides of the table, whether they're trying to create war with Iran, which is on one side, or whether they are trying to stop war with Iran, which is on the other side, everyone in the book knows that it is absolutely pointless to bring factual evidence to the media. And I, I can't emphasize strongly enough that it goes without saying to these people. They know that the, the everybody in the book knows that the deep state and the media are, if not exactly the same thing, they are married closely. And so the protagonists, the good guys and the heroes, have to do what they do knowing that. And there's no preaching about it. There's, there's no lesson. It's just a given in the book. And uh, I certainly appreciate that because in real life, you meet people who seem to be still uh, enamored of the mainstream press and the mainstream and the alternative media, for that matter, many of them, uh, because such things as what actually happened on 9-11 are never ever mentioned other than to reinforce the lie that we were told on 9-11. The lies about the four disappearing planes and uh, the other fantastical events that occurred are accepted now as legend and myth, and there's no point in saying anything about them, which makes this legal effort, uh, which gives a certain amount of importance to the legal effort, because there are people higher up as you go throughout the legal system who are also well aware that any move they make in the direction of 9-11 truth could be career ending. That's real life. That's not just what happens in the book. And we know that because I have, since I've followed this and I've reported it and I've interviewed people whose careers have been ended, I'm, I'm well aware of the power of that lie and how important it is for them to maintain that lie. And so I'm going to ask Philip a question that he and I have been sort of playing with, which is the importance of 9-11 historically, and not just the importance of the event, but the importance of the ramifications of the event. So if that wasn't too convoluted a question, I'll turn it over to Philip. Jimmy, you make a, a very good point about how uh, the, the media, the, the mainstream media, avoids 9-11. Uh, and you know something, uh, what I, I've seen among reporters is not just that they avoid it, but that mainstream reporters really resent the truthers, be, uh, because the truthers essentially have scooped them. They have gotten to the story, and the reporters haven't, and they don't want to admit that. In the second place, the, re the truthers have the freedom to really 
go after the truth. And reporters, mainstream reporters I'm talking about here, they do not have that freedom. And they resent it because they know, they know that there's more to this story than they've been able to report. And of course, 9-11 is the biggest, uh, the biggest um, mass uh, massacre uh, in American history, even just a massacre of civilians, of people uh, just at, at work going about their jobs. It's probably the biggest crime in American history. Um, and yet reporters cannot go there. And I think that's one reason that they hate the truthers. The other thing is that reporters generally are conservatives, in the sense that they are real believers in the system. And they don't want to rock the boat. You see all these reporters going after the the uh, stories of, about behind the candidates and this and that, and they really believe in this system of finding out the truth and the candidates and an election and a democracy, and they don't want to rock the boat and they don't want to offer a story that says, well, this whole thing has really been a lie. So anyways, that's uh, my point about that. As to 9-11 as to in history, um, it's, um, I, I would say there are, are two things that are, are really at play. Um, the first is, in the classic decline of America, that, uh, the, uh, 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 the classic de decline of empire that America is following, 9-11 marks the beginning of the drive for power of the military security sector. This is, this is my opinion. Mm -hmm. They are replacing the rich plutocracy that, to a large extent, began with the Reagan administration. That's when, really, the divergence in income equality really started to take off. In the 60s and 70s, 50s, there, the income equality was really uh, not so bad in America. But uh, in the 80s, it really took off. And now what we're seeing is uh, the plutocracy, which is the next to last step in the decline of empire, being followed by a military dictatorship. Um, and this is the, the military security sector now uh, taking over the country from, from the rich. Um, although, of course, the forms of democracy are always kept in place. Now, you see this very clearly with the Homeland Security Department, which is now the third largest uh, uh, department in government. And they are checking everything um, and slowly working with a lot of the rich Internet websites like Facebook and Amazon, which have more and more uh, defense contracts and are working more and more with defense. Um, and second, then, the other point of 9-11 uh, to me was that the purpose of 9-11 was to completely change the conversation. Before we had communism and now we have terrorism, which suits the, the deep state much more because, as you were talking about before, Jim, Terrorism is a ghost. Terrorism is whatever you you want it to call, whatever you want to call it. Even the the poor uh, uh, immigrants coming in from Central America are being labeled terrorists. And uh, before, what you had was communism, but communism was backed up by a country with borders and, and uh, leaders and uh, capital and uh, currency, tangible things. But terrorism is what. Terrorism is much more difficult and expensive to combat because it's essentially a ghost. Anything can be terror. And again, this is why we have Homeland Security, which is placed on top of both the military uh, uh, that we have, plus the security system, the CIA, FBI, etc., that we have. And, uh, you know, this is, as I say, to me, 9-11, of course, the secondary objectives were Afghanistan, Iraq, etc., etc. That's that's uh, no argument there. But I think that the main uh, reason, which I think that the larger uh, the larger point that people miss, is that it was the point was to completely change our perception of the world and, and change our our enemy. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and to pick up on what you said about terrorism being a ghost. That way, they get to invent the scenario 
continually over and over again. And the, 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 to me, the fact that terrorism is an invention for that purpose is a, something that angers me every time I think about it. It angers me no end because it, it, it changed the conversation, but it changed the way we all live. It changed the way we fly on an airplane. It changed the way we, we walk into a building. It, it changed everything, and it was all created with the myth of 9-11. And so it's so important to keep the idiots, the sheep, the way that you want to keep them. If, if you can't maintain that myth, then maybe there'll be a few more sheep who step out of the flock and more, a few more people who are thinking about what actually happened to them. And, and to me, that includes the monetary system, the web of debt, uh, hegemony over everything, and the taking over of territory. The, the slaughter of Pal Palestinians sort of fits into that, too. And the number of Americans you find who think it's perfectly OK for Israel to slaughter Palestinians because, and they give you the quote, you know, they give you the same old crap no matter what the evidence is, Israel has a right to defend itself. End of discussion yeah. for them. That's, that's it. So that there are a lot of ends of discussions for these people because they're incapable of following the logic to the next step. Now, we, we have one minute left. So, Philip, uh, what do you have to say about that? Well, well just, one, just one last comment, Jim. I don't think anybody that I've ever uh, uh, read has ever asked why destroy the buildings. Why not just ram the ram the two buildings with uh, with the airplanes? And the reason is just what you're talking about, Jim. You had to really terrify the country, mm -hmm. so you had to bring the the buildings down. They had to, with you know, the risk of uh, of detection and so on and so forth. They had to mine the buildings with explosives, and that was really the point that was going to terrify people, and it worked very well. One thing you have to say about the people who did 9-11, they had a lot of vision. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, uh, when you look at it very carefully like that, it was uh, very carefully planned and very carefully brought off. Yeah, and they knew that they had the media behind them all the way, no matter how th badly they got caught, the media would cover up for them. Well, nine seconds left. Thank you, everyone, for listening. and. Uh, Hopefully we will be back with part four. Thank you.